The following production is part of the Play Some Video Games Podcast Network. Welcome to Board with Video Games, the gaming podcast that strives for the right balance of coverage for games you play on your table and on your television. You can think of us as the fruits and vegetables of gaming podcasts. We're a proud member of the PSVG Podcast Network and still to be part of the Dice Tower Network as well. I'm one of your hosts, Kyle, and joining me on this co-op adventure, the guy who sweetens the podcast naturally, Josh, how are you doing this evening? Oh, you know, I could be better. I could be worse. So I'm happy to be here. I agree. I agree. It is. <laughs> I, w- I was sharing with you before we started the show. I'm in a really <laughs> kind of disgruntled mood this evening. <laughs> so hopefully the podcast will still be as, you know, awesome as usual. But uh, yeah, I don't know. It's something. I don't know if it's just something in the water, something about everything else that's going on in the world or what. But goodness, just not feeling it today. That is for sure. Well, let's try to make you. Well, I'll do some of that sweetness that i naturally uh give this podcast and make you feel a little bit better <laughs> well you, i have no doubt that you'll be able to handle that uh so are you if you had to pick one fruits or vegetables which do you prefer the, oh really <laughs> yeah are there there's people, people who, who would really say like vegetables, vegetables? <laughs> i think there's some people who would say vegetables no i'm a fruits guy gotcha do you have a particularly a particular fruit that is your favorite well i, I think raspberries have always been my fra- favorite fruit if i had to they say they're good but I like apples. I like all that kind of stuff. I was just eating celery uh, and peanut butter the other day, though, so I do occasionally snack on lower vegetable vegetables. <laughs> <laughs> lower vegetables? It's, not, okay. it's more water than, I think, vegetable. <laughs> uh, do you have? Is there any fruits you don't like? Uh, oh, what a good question. I don't know. Um, maybe, not that I can think of, but you could probably like put something in front of me that I'd be like, oh, yeah, I didn't. I don't remember... Not liking this, but I don't like it. Um, I can't think of a specific one, though. Yeah, you? I, I'm I'm a fan of pretty much all fruits. The only fruit I can't really eat these days is kiwi fruit. Oh. Um, I just, I don't know that I'm allergic to it, but I, maybe I am just straight up allergic to it. I don't know, but I kind of break out when I eat it. Oh, yeah, okay. So I I, maybe I'm just straight up allergic, but I ate it a ton as a kid. So that's the thing I don't totally understand. But as an adult, I just have never really been able to eat kiwi. Well, your allergies change all the time. I have a pineapple allergy, but I love pineapple and it's a minor allergy. So I actually don't let it deter (laughs) me from eating pineapple. My throat swells up a little bit, but uh, not not so much that I fear my life. Well, I guess uh, good. I guess that... (laughs) It's you know, a stupid thing that I keep eating it, but I just enjoy reasonable it. risks. Yeah. Uh, so, do you have a favorite vegetable then? I uh, I mean I I can't say corn right because it's it's like in every so arguable that it's not even a vegetable. Um, potatoes probably corn and potatoes. Okay, that's not bad. I'm a big pepper fan. Red pepper, green peppers, uh, yellow yeah. peppers. So yeah. a big fan of those. Has some of those actually with dinner this evening. So that's always something that, especially in the summer, I cook a lot of those on the grill. We have a lot of kind of that stir fry yeast type yeah. vegetables together on the grill. Ugh, I had a lobster delicious. roll for dinner, kid. <laughs> really? Yeah. Lobster roll? Yeah, we don't have a lot of lobsters in Iowa. <laughs> which I know that doesn't mean I couldn't buy lobster, but it just makes me very uh, skeptical about buying lobster. <laughs> yeah, I know. I hear you. It's probably fake. <laughs> so yeah. that sounds really good, though. I wish I would have had a lobster roll for dinner. That would have been delicious. It was nice. I had sausage and peppers, which probably makes sense. Still sounds good. Me. Yeah, it was very good. So, But hey, you know what? Enough of the food stuff. We're going to get to the business. So thanks <laughs> so much for joining us this week, everyone. As always, if you have any feedback, questions, suggested topics, hit us up at Board with VG on Twitter or check out all the awesome stuff over on the Instagram, also Board with VG. We are a proud part of playing some video games, and PSVG is on Patreon. We're absolutely thrilled with the support you have given us there thus far. And if you'd like to monetarily support what we do, you can find us there at patreon.com slash PSVG. But the most important thing is just that you listen and maybe share our show with someone who you think would enjoy it. We're also a member of the Dice Tower Podcast Network. So if you enjoy our conversations about board games and would like to dive deeper into that world, 
We encourage you to check out the Dice Tower podcast as well as all the other members of the network. No matter what type of board games you enjoy, there's a podcast on the network that's right for you. Josh, I will throw it to you. What is your first topic for the show this week? Cool. Well, let's go with, well, something that I didn't know was happening. I kind of knew. So Destiny 2 uh, is continuing to evolve and expand. Um, and ahead of its new DLC drop, Destiny decided to jump on the Fortnite bandwagon and throw a real-time event in-game. Um, I did know. So let's talk about Destiny 2's DLC first. So uh, there is... There have been a few new teasers, a few teasers dropped um, for Destiny 2, and I, I, my calendar is still in May. So when I went to look at <laughs> when June 9th, 9th was, I lost my brain. Uh, so the day we drop this episode, uh, you will also be able to see the trailer for the new DLC uh, or Season 11 of Destiny 2 um, and beyond. Um, so... There's some some information. I'm not going to try to explain to people what's going on in Destiny 2 storyline because I'm an expansion behind. Right. Um, but uh, I'm, I haven't given up on Destiny. It's just something I, I'll i get to it when I'm done getting to other things, if that makes sense. Yep. Um, so we have... Um, some more information uh, coming up. However, what we do know is the other day, yesterday for us, um, Destiny 2 had its in-game event where um, around 1 p.m. Eastern, they had this. And once again, I'm not familiar with what's going on. It's this giant ship in the sky. Uh, and it looks like it, there was some sort of orbital bombardment and essentially if if you watch you can see videos they're all over the uh, internet uh, of people in the game just destroy the ship uh, it was really cool to watch all the players at the tower watching it happen um and then it, it it's getting criticized because it was slow but i give it credit for maybe some sense of realism um because <laughs> what happens is like this ship just plummets down into the atmosphere, crack, on fire, just flames shooting out, and it, it just passes by the whole tower. And if you wanted to watch the whole thing, you have to like run all the way across the tower okay. and watch it um, collapse and explode into the mountains. Um, there was a couple shockwaves that happened. The first shockwave was from the explosion. The second one was from the crash. It was actually pretty cool, and it was the Almighty. That's what the name of the ship was. Um, and I guess it was 90 minutes long. I don't know that I would have stuck around for that part. It's a long time. But from the video I saw, it didn't, it didn't feel that way. I'm getting this info from a Kotaku article. So, um, take that for what it is. I'm not really sure if it was really 90 minutes long or I saw, um, a sped up video or something. Um, but I think it's interesting to see. Uh, them taking this approach to to the game, it's it shows uh, even a, even if it's an old thing that has been going on, I think it still shows like Destiny is continuing to evolve its its mm-hmm. image, and the fact that we're still getting more Destiny two content and not really like people worrying about a Destiny three being announced. Uh, right. So with all this going on, actually, I didn't even I don't even really want to ask you about this event. I want to ask you, um, what do you think is in the future uh, for Destiny? Do you think we're going to see a Destiny 3, or do you think they're going to keep on expanding the Destiny story through Destiny 2? I'm of two minds of this. Part of me thinks, because if they had been, and I could be wrong about this, but if they had stuck with Activision, mm-hmm. I assume this year would have been Destiny 3 year. I think so. That was. I think that's what the rumor was. So... But they Destiny or Bungie did come out and say that Destiny. I think they said specifically right that Destiny Two will be on next gen consoles. Yeah. Yep. So that because of that, I don't anticipate we're going to have Destiny Three before next fall. Right. So, 
I feel like, you know, we have a couple people that are part of PSVG who are huge Destiny fans. Yes. Massive Destiny fans. Uh, Dev obviously being probably the biggest one. But I haven't heard him say anything about Destiny until since the new this whole new year, basically. <laughs> yeah, I think he gave up on us uh, not sharing his hype. So I think he's still been super excited about everything, but has toned down the Destiny push in the PSVG Discord. Interesting, because my assumption was that he just wasn't playing as much anymore. And maybe I'm wrong. I just wonder if how much people are really playing destiny 2 anymore i know from everything i've read and seen that this current season that they're in which is wrapping up um will wrap up when this uh, announcement happens the day this podcast releases and they talk about kind of what's next i know the season wraps up then i've heard that this current season is massively disappointing for most people okay um and i i think the the theory is is that the reason being is they have shifted resources to working on the next big expansion okay so that you know i don't think that we're going to have that expansion obviously kick off on tuesday but i think maybe we're going to get the announcement of what that expansion is maybe for this fall yeah is what this this is going to be and that you know the probably some quality of life improvements for the next season but maybe this season 12 i think is what they're going to be on this will be kind of the last season before the next big expansion happens and, you know, Destiny 2 is a game, or Destiny in general, but especially Destiny 2, is a game I've always liked. I, I enjoyed playing it when I played it. I just don't know why I haven't gone back to it as much. Yeah. Because I know you, too, it seems like have really kind of gotten into the cycle <laughs> of really into it and then kind of fall off and then really into it for a while and kind of fall off. Would you say that's accurate? Yeah, Destiny is a game where if I can pick it up at any point and get immediately, I can immediately be right back into it. Um, right. I think my challenge was coming back into the Destiny 2 DLC stuff is uh, it really makes you feel lost if you're not keeping up. Um, and to their credit, they've changed a lot of um, mechanics and gameplay, but that's not really... If I played Destiny 2 and then didn't come back until Forsaken... Like, which is kind of like what happened. I didn't know what the heck I was doing. The maps are different. There were different like missions and different ways to get missions. And, and it was all very unclear um, as to how to do these things. And I know that that kind of happens with games of service anyways. Right. Um, but I never had that problem with Destiny 1. Uh, even when I did take breaks over like DLC and stuff like that. So it just, for me going back, I can still enjoy what I'm doing. But the reason why I stop is because I don't think I'm progressing or like the last time I went back, all the stuff that was in the newest DLC that I didn't buy was still mm-hmm. popping up on the map as things that I should be doing, but then I couldn't do them and it became right. extremely frustrating. Um, so I kind of just uh, uh, abandoned that. So I think if I, if I did, if this trailer like sells me on what's going on, I think what I would probably do in this case is just buy enough that it catches me up with all the DLC. Right. So that I'm not, so that I can just do things um, as I want to. For sure. Interestingly enough, and I guess this just shows and proves to me, you know, the bubble that I'm in. I'm looking at Twitch right now. Yeah. And Destiny 2 has. 17,000 viewers right now. Wow. Which, I mean, that's not top 10, but that's top 20. Yeah. And that is right there with right around things like Team Fight Tactics, Overwatch, uh, kind of in that ballpark, Hearthstone. So we're talking, you know, the big games are still bigger games. You know, it's not up in the Valorant League of Legends Fortnite area, but it, it's still doing pretty well as far as people watching and, and having the streaming, the streams happen. So that's good for it. So, I mean, this is just a situation of a, a community that I'm just not as connected with. I just haven't heard anyone talk about Destiny 2 in so long. Yeah, Dev, if you're listening, hit us up on the Discord or Twitter. Let us know if you're still playing. And and actually, let us know what you think about Destiny 3 happening, if it's going to happen. When do you think Destiny 3 happens? Me? Uh, do you think it happens? I think it could have come out um, this October. Uh, for the next gen consoles, I think they could have, but um, right. 
I don't know. Uh, I have a hard... T- I, I think my biggest worry, if they don't put out a Destiny 3 next year, if they'll fall behind graphically. Right. And, and I I think that's still important to Destiny's player base, is that the game runs smooth and looks good. So if they can get out, and if they're already developing Destiny 3 for next gen, I think mm-hmm. you know maybe next August is a good release date for them. But if they're making money and they're doing well... With their season updates, like I don't blame them for keeping going either. So, uh, um, but I mean, I would be excited for Destiny Three because I really, for me, I would be able to feel like I was getting a fresh start, even if it's just a renamed season update. You know, like if, with a right. graphics enhancement. So, like <laughs> that would still fool me into buying a new uh, Destiny game. So, one thing that tr- kind of brings up for me. Obviously, we've heard Microsoft talk about there's not from their first party studios. It's going to be a year or two before there's any Xbox Series X exclusives. Yeah. Obviously, we know there's some third party exclusives, but we know that from the first party is going to be a bit. Do you think that if they were to release Destiny 3 next fall, so, you know, a year after the next gen consoles launch, do you really anticipate that they would make it next gen only? Yes. Um, really okay based off of destiny destiny one and what happened with their forward generation right where basically the 360 and ps3 versions were i wouldn't say unplayable but noticeably worse than right the current gen at that time so yeah i think that's just something that they would they should avoid uh, if at all possible right and obviously their publishing is different they have they're independent now I just think because it'd be about the same time frame because Destiny came out about a year. It was just shy of a year, right? Because the consoles came out in 2013 and then Destiny was 2014. Is that right? I honestly, I'll look it up because I have uh, no time awareness. <laughs> I think that's right. I think it was, you know, not quite a year that the, you know, the consoles came out in November and then it was uh, September, October the following year that Destiny 1 came out. So, oh, Destiny 1 or 2? Destiny 2. One. Destiny 2 came out uh, la, 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 la. September 6, 2017. Destiny 1. Oh, why did I just put Destiny 1? What is wrong with me? <laughs> yeah, that's that's going to come up in a Google search. Destiny 1. <laughs> uh, Destiny came out 2014. Yeah, so about a year after. Yeah, and then, yeah, and then, well, I'm curious, Destiny uh, Xbox One. Oh, it came out the same day for all consoles, September 9th, yeah, 2014, because, yeah. Yeah, because the PS4 and Xbox One released in November of 2013. Yeah, okay, you're right, so, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. No, yeah, it's totally fine. So what I'm saying is, since it's going to be, obviously, again, they don't have to worry about Activision. Right. But just wondering if it is, you know, kind of that same time frame, would they really want to, especially if... You know, a company like Microsoft is is even with their first party not yeah. pushing next gen as hard. I, I wonder if Bungie would say, "Okay, you know, we are going exclusive next gen." If they do release it, you know, in a year ish from now, if they still support Destiny two, if they still have like maybe two more DLCs to come out, right? I think that that would make it an easier pill to swallow for people who are on the last gen at that point. Yeah. Um, I can see that, but yeah, I mean, I think you make a good point. It's like literally like the same formula, so maybe th- maybe they would um, do that. And we still don't know what the jump is cra- uh, console generation wise. So maybe it would right. be just fine keeping it on both. Yeah, because um, you know we definitely saw a big jump graphically from last gen to current gen now. So right, you know. Once we actually start seeing some games in action on these on these consoles yeah. that are coming out in a few months, uh, I think we'll be able to speak more to that. Yeah. And, you know, there have been a lot of rumors and, and speculation, or maybe they've come out and said it, that putting Destiny on both previous and current gen uh, was challenging and, and perhaps hampered the game a little bit. You know, we don't necessarily know with these next-gen consoles how much more they're going to be able to push things. So who knows, maybe they, like you said, don't want to 
put it on current gen what you know the the systems we have now because they would see that as holding back destiny 3 too much from what they truly want to do yeah um it'd be interesting i'll be very interested to see what happens there because yeah destiny's a cool game it's a lot of fun i just don't know what they're gonna need to do especially for me to get me to come back and play it again hey i mean as a person who just started playing (laughs) no man's sky beta beta on xbox which i'm like why is there a beta the game has been out on xbox for what a year now i think it was 20 summer 2018 yeah, wasn't it but i'm in a beta for it right now on xbox uh, oh okay well that's cool <laughs> which i guess i could probably talk about it but it wouldn't let me take screenshots so maybe i can't talk about it so who knows <laughs> well maybe but, yeah. it's beta testing the their newest update because they're adding mechs or whatever they're adding isn't it mechs or something like that oh maybe i don't know they're, it's a lot different from when i first started playing which is very much like destiny that's how i'm gonna <laughs> bring it right back to that <laughs> no that makes sense for sure anything else you want to say about uh destiny and their attempt to kind of lure players with a Fortnite style event i'll say just talking about it right now makes me want to go play it again so uh, uh it, it actually kind of makes me want to play it too so <laughs> so it still has its hooks in me i just just i keep pulling away yeah i hear you i hear you all right well we're gonna transition from some destiny news to some board game news and some sad board game news really uh last week or two weeks ago one of the two uh, we talked about how Funko had this huge lineup of new games they were going to be releasing. A uh, really uh, ambitious list of games that were all supposed to come out sometime this year. Well, now um, in a story published on June 5th on ICV2 uh, by Milton Gripe over there, uh, Funko plans to cut 25% of its employees. Um, and these are not furloughs. These employees are gone. Um, reading from the story, quote, Funko is making a 25% reduction in its global workforce, according to an SEC filing. The move is being made in connection with its efforts to reduce costs and preserve liquidity, liquidity excuse me, in response to the uncertainty of the COVID-19 pandemic. The majority of the cuts will be made by the end of quarter two. With the remainder of the, by the end of quarter three, the company will take one million charge for termination costs. So it's important to know that back in April, Funko had started furloughing some employees uh, in order to try to save some money and to stay in good shape uh, as far as, uh, you know, being able to maintain their business and and trying to stay uh, profitable. Uh, In quarter one, they saw an 18% drop in sales. And then quarter two, there's an expected 60% drop in sales. Uh, So Funko... Just announced a whole bunch of new games. Now seems to be hurting significantly financially. Uh, Josh, what's your take on this article and this information? <laughs> well, first of all, I got sidetracked by one of these other stories that might not mean anything to anyone but comic book nerds. But DC cutting off Diamond is an insane yeah. thing that I just read. And yes, I will very be interesting. reading more of that later. <laughs> um, as far as Funko goes... Uh, 25% is a huge number. But when I saw that they're expected to take a 60% drop in quarter two, I think that's a low number. That is a huge oh, okay. cut. I don't think it's, I don't think that they should, it's, it stinks that they're letting anyone go. But right. to take a 60% drop in quarter two sales in an industry that you can largely order online still through this mm-hmm. pandemic, uh, that's, that's an incredible loss. And, I I don't know. I feel like seeing companies take huge hits like that make like I don't know how many employees this is, but twenty five percent as a number, um, it just seems like that it could have been higher with that much if they're expected to lose that much. Obviously, there could be more cuts if they do hit as much as they expect, or right. less cuts if they don't. Um, either way, yeah, it's terrible, and uh, I, I'm curious how much this affects their their board game industry or if this is specifically in in the figures or if it's just kind of all amassed together because they really are investing a lot in all these new board game titles and IPs, which they're spending a lot of money on these licenses, especially for even just their figures. They have to pay for the licensing and all those too. So, right. um, I mean, it's definitely a business where they're putting a lot of money into those licenses. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I, I mean, we hate, we talk about this a lot. We see companies lay people off, 
usually you see it in video games more more mm-hmm. than video game uh, board games. Uh, although I would say in the last year there's been a lot in board games. Uh, but just in general, as Funko as a company, uh, yeah, it stinks. I I don't have any business like I, I acumen on this because like I go into every store and there's usually thousands of Funko Pops and and True. hundreds of them are on clearance or on sale. So I'm not really sure what their profit margin is on each Funko and <laughs> when a Buffy Funko sells for you know 150 thousand, but uh, a Willow. <laughs> Pop sells for a dollar because they can't sell it right. for thirteen. I'm not really sure where, where things are going for them, but uh, yeah. I, either way, no matter how you spin it, it's terrible that people are losing their jobs. Oh, absolutely. Uh, and I think something that's interesting to think about this too is in reading the stories earlier about the sixty percent drop per quarter two that they're anticipating. A big reason for that is that. They are moving, at least in Europe, all their quarter two releases in Europe are moved to quarter three. So all of their new releases from quarter two aren't happening in Europe anymore. So that's one reason, obviously, they're going to take a hit. Plus, they had so many, in reading the story really briefly, they have so many entertainment properties that are tied into movie releases and all these other things that with all the movies that got delayed out of summer, all of those products also got delayed, basically. So it's not just as simple for them as, hey, people aren't buying our games. It's the contracts they have and the the tie-in merchandise that they've created can't go to market because the the properties are tied to uh got delayed for into later 2020 or in some cases an entire year until you know 2021 All those fast and furious uh from yeah, Pops right that we exactly can't see exactly <laughs> so uh interesting thing that a part of the story that is also on icv2 that talks about the story that talks about the 60 percent cut they're anticipating for quarter two um funko listed their top 10 properties in quarter one and I thought this was a very interesting list. Uh, their top 10 properties going from 10 to 1. Uh, Fortnite was number 10. Dragon Ball Z is at 9. Maximum Venom is 8. DC Comics is 7. Naruto is 6. Harry Potter is 5. Avengers Endgame is 4. Mandalorian was 3. Nice. Pokemon, 2. And number 1, Star Wars Classic. Nice. Some Harry Potter news this week, too, huh? But we won't get into that. We're Yeah, we're... <laughs> We're in the middle of a, a rewatch of all the Harry Potter movies, and I'll tell you, it's it's, it's been a pretty big b- bummer. <laughs> yeah, J.K. Rowling just needs to uh, stop talking. <laughs> and I always feel bad saying that because people are allowed to have you know their opinions about stuff, but she really does not do herself any favors. That is for sure. So, <laughs> uh, but like you said, definitely sad. You know that is a huge part of their staff that is no longer going to be employed. And I have to imagine if you're someone there now. You hear this financial news that, hey, we're making these cuts, but you don't know if you have a job still. That's got to be really scary. Yeah. Um, so good luck. Hopefully all their employees are able to land on their feet. That's a huge, you know, taking out 25% of your employees is a ton. Um, but hopefully everything there goes positively for everyone as as good as it can, uh, considering the circumstances. So anything else about Funko, Josh, you'd like to talk about? Hey, let's just hope they have a better quarter three and bring all those employees back. Agreed. That would be wonderful. For sure. Uh, Josh, what is your second topic? Hey, let's go from heavy to heavy. (laughs) Uh, So we had a few events postponed recently due to protests around the country, uh, two of which were EA and Sony. I want to go over our thoughts on this, but what I first figured, I'm just going to take this from GameSpot and do my best not to plagiarize it, but I'm just going to read a little bit of each just to give it the context it deserves before I... Hey, we're citing the site. Just make yeah. sure we cite the offer. It's fine. Yeah. So it's by Steve Watts. He posted this on June 5th. This is for EA Play. So EA Play Live, the Lime, Street, Lime Street, streamed uh, event being held in uh, absence of EA's regular uh, E3 adjacent festivities has been delayed. Um, it was scheduled for June 11th, but in light of the ongoing race, racial justice protests, the company has decided to push back its event it's now scheduled June eighteenth, only a week uh, after, so it's not it's not a huge delay. Um, but EA uh, released a statement, uh, partially saying, uh, with the important conversations taking place and important voices being heard around the world right now, we're moving our time to come play together and play. So that was from EA. We also had, arguably, the bigger. Um, delay 
Uh, and it was Sony delaying their PlayStation 5 reveal or PlayStation 5 games reveal, I think we should say. Yeah. Uh, also from GameStop is by Chris Pereira. Sony uh, has updated his article. Uh, he updated the article from Sony uh, where Sony has, pl- has postponed the planned PlayStation 5 event indefinitely. Uh, although it did not cite ongoing Black Lives Matter protests as the reason it did suggest the delay is to stand back and allow more important voices to be heard. Uh, and that is following statements issued by Sony and PlayStation uh, uh, among those from many other companies in response to the protest. So Sony's official Twitter did post, we had decided to postpone PlayStation 5 events scheduled for June 4th. While we understand gamers worldwide are excited to see PlayStation 5 games, we do not feel that right now is a time for celebration, and for now we want to stand back and allow more important voices to be heard. So, let's talk about it. Uh, what do you think? What do we think? Well, I'll tell you what I think before I ask you what you think, because I don't want to just put you on the spot. No, that's uh, okay. I, th- I think uh, I have mixed feelings. I think what they're doing is important, right? I think right. That, that postponing these is a right move for them to do, yep. whether it's uh, marketing, however, or if it's genuine or whatever their stance is, which I don't doubt at all. It's just the right, smart thing to do. However, I do really think people could use some good news as well. So to see like the sound, the PlayStation 5 um, presser get delayed, was kind of a bummer or something I was really looking forward to. And honestly, something uh, I I'm obviously am not directly affected by what's going on, but we do have many PlayStation gamers who are African-American and or black, however you want to say it, that are disappointed that they don't get to see it. Um, and I'm just speaking from uh, online conversations and even in our Discord. So it is still a bummer that uh, that is delayed and we're not going to get to see those till whenever. I mean, we'll still get to see them, I think is ultimately the big thing to take away from it. Is right. It's not like we're not getting them, but um, I mean, I don't know. It's just sad that we don't get to see it come up. It's at least for the right reason or a right. good reason, however you want yeah. to view that. Uh, it's I, I, I feel like I'm fumbling because I don't want to say the wrong thing, but I think we've made our position clear on the last episode, how we feel about everything that's going on. So I hope that, oh, absolutely. that I, I don't have some other weird motivation coming out of this. Um, as far as the EA thing, I don't know um, that there was the same hype level around it, but that is irrelevant to the point. Right. They're making a statement. And, and I think the most important thing between EA and Sony and all these other companies making statements is they're making a statement. They're yeah. saying something and they're putting something out there where a lot of other um, people aren't and other companies aren't. So um, ultimately, I think it's a good thing that they postponed them. Uh, but yeah, and also some disappointment has to come because we need to focus on more important things than just PlayStation 5 games. Yeah. And I think, you know, these are obviously not the only two companies that delayed things. Uh, pretty much everyone who was supposed to have something this last week delayed what they were going to do. Yeah. Uh, and then even, you know, CD Projekt Red uh, delayed their Cyberpunk deep dive that's supposed to happen later this month. They delayed that as well. So there so there are, are a lot of companies who are pushing back what they're doing. You know, the cheeky part of me wants to say, well, you know, EA said that they, you know, really are moving things because of you know the ongoing racial justice protests so it's great that those will all be solved by june 18th i know right (laughs) and i i obviously that's not true that's not accurate but i also recognize the fact that as a company at some point you have to go forward and and do your thing yeah Uh, no matter what you feel about the situation or what statement you put out as a company at some point you have to continue commence your business uh and, and your operation of how things are going I do think, like I said, like you had said, I, I, I think them delaying it is the right thing. It's part of the reason that uh, we have, not that we were ever super active on social media, but it's part of the reason that you have not seen really any social media activity from us is because 
I just didn't really feel like there was anything credible we could lend to the conversation and yeah. anything else would just be distracting from everything else that's going on. Uh, you know, I, like you said, Josh, we, I think we're very clear last week and where we stand on everything and, and, and trying to be su- as supportive as we can be. But I, you know, obviously I would have loved to have seen the Sony event last week just because I was, I'm a huge Sony pony and I'm excited to see what they have to share. <laughs> I will be just as excited whenever it happens. Yeah. And I anticipate it will still happen this month. Yeah, I mean, you th- you think they have a they have a timeline and a plan on what they want to do, so they def- it definitely right. has to come out. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's obviously a difficult conversation to have in the aspect of like, what is like, is it even really important in the grand scheme of things? How do we even view these things now? And ov- and yes, to, to just EA delaying it a week for sure isn't. They probably could have put a better. Uh, a uh, stamp on that, why they were doing it. Maybe just to right. like, uh, because, well, I, and something that I see on social media is it isn't, we have, we hope that people are still talking about this in a week because there's a lot, of, there are a lot of people who are worried that it's just not going to be talked about in a week. So, um, so I think uh, to diverge a little bit from Sony and EA, I think things in general, as far as, Peaceful protest wise seem to be getting a little bit better, at least mm-hmm. uh, overall. But unfortunately, there's still some places where that is not the case. We're just hoping here that that we get a PlayStation event, we get an EA event, and we have continuing peaceful protests leading up to then and afterwards uh, until well, until this thing uh, gets some. I guess what justice is what we want to say. Yeah. What do you? There's been some talk about. You know, companies making these statements. Yeah. Which is, you know, important and good. But is making a statement enough? You know, you look at a company like Square Enix, as example, who made a statement and then donated $250,000 yeah. to charities. Is You know, most companies have just come out, had a nice little statement, and then if they've done something else in addition, we really haven't seen it. Now, we see a lot of active i don't want to say members of the of enthusiast gaming press media influencers all of those people have been doing a lot of work with streams raising money and them donating money individually like there's been a lot of work done on that front yeah but i don't know that i've seen a ton of companies you know for lack of a better word putting the money where the mouth is yeah i mean i agree i don't know um where companies are financially with our current uh, situation like seeing right. like Funko, they have twenty five percent of their employees, sure, uh, and uh, companies like that. I also, honestly, on the opposite end, I've seen people calling out companies for not saying enough, yep. or the right things, and I also don't agree with that because this is a decision that people make on their own, and as a company, it's harder to make. I think. I don't think it's hard for a company to come out and say Black Lives Matter. I don't think that that's hard, right? Right. I think it's hard for companies to say the right thing or at the right time. Um, But if I'm sitting around, I'm not looking around the internet to see if Sega has made a tweet saying they support Black Lives Matter. I'm more focused on who's out there saying what and who's doing what and how to help. Like, I'm not going to try to sit down and put up a list and call off like – um, some made a comment about startling games not doing enough or not saying enough fast enough. I'm like, they said something. Give them like that's something that they did. They said something, and you kind of criticize them. So I don't know. I don't want to get off on a tangent, but if a company can financially support a donation to Black Lives Matters or or these groups where they're providing um, lawyers for people that are getting arrested, right, um, or the NAACP. Do I think that they should donate? I 100% agree with that. Or they can start a grassroots movement where they're just trying to show you where you can donate, even if they are not donating. Right. These are the places you can go. And honestly, if you go, if my Instagram is 100% full of people supporting that and sharing links and books you can read and black owned yep. restaurants you can eat at and, and all these things that you can do to help support, if you're not, if you're a company, and you're not going to donate, I think that that is the least you can do, is signal boost those people who are trying to help other people. 
Yeah, no, I agree. And I think in some, in many times, just as much as making a statement that a lot of companies have made, and I think the interesting thing, how you talked about, as a quick tangent here, that you're not going out and like mentally checking a box of like every company who has said something. Yeah. There are definitely people who are doing that oh, in order to tell people <laughs> not to shop at those places anymore or to support those places anymore, yeah. which to me is preposterous as all get up. But anyway, it's not here nor there. <laughs> I, it's one thing to make the donation, which I think is good. And if you can do that as a company, I think that's great. But I think almost more importantly as a company is to say, okay, we've made this statement. Here is what we're going to do in the future to ensure that our hiring processes are not discriminatory. To ensure the places that we work are supportive of people from different backgrounds who might not represent the majority of what our company currently is. And I think really showing how you are going to create opportunities for all people to be successful at your companies who maybe haven't been able to before because of the systems and structures you have in place. That to me would be way more impactful than saying, oh, and we gave $250,000 to NAACP, which is still great. And if they can do that, wonderful. But I think creating opportunities, that's what makes a, a huge difference. So for these companies who have just come out with these statements, I would love for them to say internally, here's what we're reviewing to ensure that our processes and our and our procedures uh, are going to be more equitable in the things that we do. And that's the thing I'm really disappointed to not seeing as much other than like Ben and Jerry's because Ben and Jerry's, yeah. <laughs> my goodness, those dudes, whoo. <laughs> They got arrested. Yeah. Hey, they're just out there living life, doing their thing. So um, I don't know if everyone has to go that far. But I did hear, actually, that uh, the founder of Bungie and a whole bunch of Bungie employees um, were at protests and got tear gassed uh, wow. by Seattle police. Yeah. So oh boy. That, th- that happened. So anyway, anything else you want to talk about? Uh, the delays, obviously, the <laughs> protests are still ongoing. But as you said, they, they seem to be getting more peaceful at this point, fewer altercations at this point. Um, and I have a feeling this may be a topic for a board with everything this month. So. I don't think that it can't be. <laughs> it's yeah, exactly. Ev- it's in everyone's life, yeah. No, I mean, I don't want to to uh, get off topic too much, but um, I'm also happy to talk about the topic too. So if people want to engage in conversation with me, uh, social media is the way to do that. Agreed. All right, Josh, my second topic uh, – is a, from a story over on Games Radar, hmm. and it asks the question: Did Google Stadia overpromise and underdeliver? Yes, uh, because the because <laughs> the boss of Take Two, the CEO of Take Two, seems to think so. So this article uh, by Connor Sheridan over again on Games Radar. Uh, in the article, it says, quote, Take Two CEO Strauss Zelnick spoke about the early struggles of Google's game streaming service during a talk at the Bernstein Annual Strategic Decisions Conference, which sounds like a very exciting conference to go to, uh, as reported by GameSpot. While Zelnick says, quote, streaming technology is upon us, end quote, he noted that Stadia's launch has been slow, quote, I think there was some overpromising on what the technology could deliver and some coomer- consumer disappointment as a result, end quote. So, Josh... This is, you know, take two. They have big games and they have some games on Stadia, i.e. Red Dead Redemption 2, Borderlands 3, and NBA 2K20. Those are huge hitters in the game industry. And Zelda coming out and being like, yeah, they didn't really, you know, deliver what they told us they could or would. Uh, <laughs> big deal? Small deal? Uh, what does this mean for the future of Stadia? Uh, you know, it's... it's <sighs> I don't know how to explain Stadia anymore. <laughs> As a Stadia founder, mm-hmm. former Stadia founder, right? Um, and I went back because they were doing the two months free. Uh, they literally offered like super hot and little nightmares for free this month. And last month was PUBG, right? <laughs> and this is a, a a platform that was promising games like Red Dead Redemption Two. Uh, quality wise in Assassin's Creed Odyssey. Right. These huge and Doom Eternal. Uh and they're giving you super hot and grid, an eight year old game. <laughs> and yeah. PUBG, a, f- a game that looks fifteen years old. <laughs> uh it's just I'm very I think the thing is they underpromised they overpromised and underdelivered on release. 
Mm-hmm. I still believe that they can get to what they promise, but I don't know what the deal is with their timetable. They still haven't even officially launched it, technically. They're giving it away. Oh, oh, they launched it, sorry. They launched it, but you can't you can't go into like Target and buy Stadia. Right. Right. And they're giving it away for free on uh one of the cell phone providers, it might be T Mobile or Verizon, maybe. Um, right. So some people are getting this for free and they don't even know what it is. It's not the marketing was confusing. The what what little yeah. there was. Um I just really think it was a giant flop and and i've i've gone through the ups and downs i've gone through the issues like streaming issues how it was kind of a mess and all over the place uh i know people like don who has had plenty of issues with it it's just i don't know kyle it's just kind of all over the place right the uh i, I think one of the interesting quotes from Strauss Zelnick says the belief that streaming was going to be transformative was based on a view that there were loads of people who really had an interest in interactive entertainment, really wanted to pay for it, but just didn't want to have a console. I'm not sure that turned out to be the case. And I think that was one of the biggest things we talked about when Stadia was announced was who is this for? Yes. Who is Google trying to get to purchase this? And I think that was one of the things that we never really got a clear answer to, that there was this assumption that maybe it was for people who didn't have consoles. But I don't know anyone who has Google Stadia who doesn't own a console, at least one console. Yeah, I think I agree. Like when I originally wanted to sign up for it, it was more of wanting to support the idea of it. Right. And carry, and like I was genuinely curious if it could do what it was saying. It could do, and I I did do that Assassin's Creed like um, streaming Project Cloud, streaming cloud or mm-hmm. whatever it was back way back when, and I really believed that it was something that could happen. But yeah, ultimately it comes down to I could play games on my console, or why am I playing a game on my PC when I that it's on a web browser when I have PC games I'm not playing, right? And I'm on my PC, <laughs> so yeah. For me, someone who does have all the consoles. I do feel like for, it is not for me. So I and I don't necessarily know coming out of Stadia who the audience is for Stadia because even right. with Project X Cloud through Microsoft, their audience is just Microsoft right now. Yep. So I don't really know who that's going to be for either. And with these next gen consoles not doing cloud gaming like we thought they might be doing at least we don't think they are i still don't know that we're even ready for these things yeah it's interesting and you know i made the prediction at the beginning of the year that stadia wouldn't be a thing anymore (laughs) by the end of the year yeah and while i said that mostly tongue-in-cheek and it was kind of going on on a limb i I do think because of the investment google has made in this in creating studios and everything else that stadia probably is still going to be around at the end of the year but I am less and less confident that it is going to stick around and not from a the technology doesn't work situation or they don't ever get the technology to work. I I just, you know, we're people, you and I are people who talk about video games probably every day of our lives to someone. I don't remember the last time I talked to someone about Google Stadia. Yeah, (laughs) that's true. It it reminds me of when PlayStation did that 3D TV and when VR was really big in arcades and they're trying to push it to consoles first. Right. It reminds me of that where like in 3D Blu-ray players, like it <laughs> reminds me of that fad of something that eventually has become very big. So right. I think maybe perhaps cloud gaming is like that. And maybe in two or three years, we're going to be talking about how Stadia was ahead of its time and it just... And it just, you know, didn't pick up now. Yeah. And, you know, I think the Google, though, if any company has the money to just sit there and keep letting it go (laughs) until it does catch on. They can just keep it there and support it. And once it catches on, it'll be great. But they don't. They're one of the few companies who if this doesn't take off for the next, you know, 18 months, it probably isn't going to do a lot of damage to Google overall. 
Yeah, you're right. I mean, I've already I've gotten so many free Google Homes from Google that I antis- I, I anticipate in about six months they're going to start sending me free months of Stadia through my yeah. Google account. <laughs> yeah. No, I don't. I've actually I have a, f- a f- couple free Google Homes too that I've never set up. <laughs> they're just sitting in my closet. But yeah, so I don't know. I still would like to see Google do well. I would like to see Stadia, uh, you know, knock it out of the park and become another big contender in the gaming world just because anytime you have more money and more opportunity and more options like that i think it you know the whole rising tide lifts all bolts situation i I think having a strong google in the video game market is good but just like you know we talked about last week amazon just released a game and nobody cares yeah you know you have these huge companies these literally largest companies in the world companies releasing or being involved in games and no one seems to care well maybe it's Something you can't just throw money at something and expect something to come out of it. Indeed. (laughs) Indeed. But you know what, Josh? We are talking about it on our podcast. You're right. We are definitely. Yes. Yes. We are talking about it. (laughs) We are. All right, Josh. That's it. Unless you have anything else you want to talk about in regards to Stadia. I'm just bummed. I still still, got my controller. The controller is nice. I really, I don't use my Chromecast. I really thought I was going to use it. Uh, so I just really wish that it hit home better. But yeah, that's all right. Yeah, no, I hear you there. A uh, quick other real quick question before we jump into kind of our final story, if you would. Hmm. And this is just because I think it's uh, an interesting thing. There have been, uh, and this is again related to um, our, our previous story talking about, you know, game companies and other companies responding to and, um, talking about Black, Black Lives Matters and 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 voicing their support for it, some companies are going as far as yeah we're seeing this in Apex Legends right now and Call of Duty right now where there are messages in game from the companies that uh-huh. while you're waiting for matches to load and things like that 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 express their support for Black Lives Matters for um, supporting those who have been oppressed uh, different situations like that. What are your thoughts on companies, not just, like I said, not just on their social media, but literally in-game posting messages and saying, hey, here's what we stand for and believe? In general or for this specific situation? <laughs> Both. Okay. Well, for this one specifically, uh, I don't know if this makes me a bad person or not, but it makes me happy that the people who don't support this message have to read that when they're playing their games. It makes <laughs> me real happy that they have to face change that needs to happen and i i hope it makes them angry and Mm -hmm. i hope it makes them think about their decisions right and how they feel about that i do i think those specific people are going to think anything no they're just going to throw their controller or turn the game off but good i don't want to play with those people anyways (laughs) take your ball um in general i mean i guess it just depends on the message uh you you definitely have to be careful as a company with what messages you're putting out. Obviously, this is a message that I support, so um, I'm happy to see that in-game. Mm-hmm. I mean, honestly, you, you're, if, if, there are, if there are words that aren't hurting people and they're supportive and you're already in a load screen, I, good for them. I don't, you know, as long as your words aren't hurtful or being used to hurt, your, to, to hurt anybody, I, I say more power to it. Keep doing it. Uh, Get messages out there are important to people. Use your platform for good um, and let people maybe think for the 20 seconds they're waiting for the screen to change about what they just read. Mm-hmm. That's right. what I think. No, I agree. And you can find lists, especially like I said, Games Radar has a list of a whole bunch of companies who are um, actively doing things. There are, you know, places like. Uh, the Lego Group is donating four million dollars to organizations wow. dedicated to supporting Black children and educating all children about racial equality. Um, so there, are, there are companies who are out there putting big money up. Uh, Riot is matching donations from each employee up to a thousand dollars per employee. Uh, Ubisoft is donating a hundred thousand dollars. So companies are out there giving their giving money and and doing things in different ways to ensure things are. Trying to improve the situation for everyone, which I think is good. And it's interesting, too, because there are companies now, and it's the, oh, what is their name? The company that does 
You're talking about paladins? Yes, the people who do paladins. It's um, uh, High Res Studios. Thank you, High Res, because yeah, they do paladins and a number of other games. But they, yeah, they went back through like all their chat logs and banned people who had done racist messaging and things like that in chat. Um, so this is really a thing that I think is starting to change um, the way companies are handling things, the way companies are looking at things. And, you know, in some ways, making companies not afraid to hold people to certain standards, which I think is a good thing, right? Like holding people to high standards, I think is important. Yeah. Uh, and we're starting to see companies do that. So that's great. So thank you. I apologize. <laughs> I don't mean to say that they only make knockoffs, but like every game I can think of of theirs is a game that is in a category that very closely seems to resemble other games. And that's not a bad thing. They make good games. I, I enjoy Paladins. I think it's a lot of fun. Uh, I just don't like it quite as much as Overwatch. No offense, hi We don't mean it. We don't mean yes. anything by it. <laughs> so, okay, Josh, uh, topic three. How do you want to tackle this? This is a new thing for us. <sighs> okay. Well, let's see. How should we talk? Well, let's, let's start here. Uh, Board of Video Games, that's us, received an email from, or just call her Kristen, because that's her name, Kirsten or Kirsten. Uh, she uh, works with, for, or uh, around Blue Fox Entertainment, uh, which is a film studio. Yeah. So uh, we were approached to see if we wanted to review a film. How weird is that? I know. Ha, uh, but why would you reach out to board of the video games to review a film? It's because you are a member of the PSVG Patreon and you listen to board of everything? Or is it because you listen to board of the video games and sometimes we 90% talk about things that aren't board games or video games? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't know how this came to be, but I'll tell you the reason why is because the film, sometimes, always, never, is the title, uh, heavily features the game Scrabble. It does. Uh, in fact, it is potentially a character in the film, if if I could go as far as saying that. Um, so yeah, it's really bizarre for us, but I think it was pretty cool uh, to have the opportunity to do so. So um, Kyle and I both received uh, screeners. Thank you to Blue Fox Entertainment for that in Kirsten or Kirsten. I should probably should ask her to say her name. Um, so yeah, we watched the movie. Sometimes, always, never. Uh, and if you have seen the trailer or haven't, I can tell you I knew the reference right away because I my dad growing up. So it's a reference to a three button suit. Yep, jacket where the top button is sometimes buttoned, the middle button is always buttoned and the bottom button is never buttoned never it is a very quick part of the movie uh mm -hmm. where you go oh they said the name of it in the they did it <laughs> <laughs> so that is something that happened but uh, what i thought we could do before we start is um i'll go to the production notes and read the synopsis and i think we can just kind of pick it up from there and talk about sounds it. good we don't have to do are like fast and furious retrospective. We can kind of just talk about the film uh, as we uh, watch it. So the synopsis is Alan is a stylish tailor uh, with moves as sharp as his suits. He has spent years searching tirelessly for his missing son, Michael, who stormed out over a game of Scrabble with a body to identify and his family torn apart. Alan must repair the relationship with his younger son, Peter and solve the mystery of an online player who he thinks could be Michael, so he can finally move on and reunite his family. <coughs> so that synopsis covers a lot of information that you do not get right away. Uh, right. <laughs> what you do know, uh, it stars Bill Nye. Uh, you probably know him if you've seen Love Actually. He's also mm -hmm. been in Pirates of the Caribbean um, and many other uh, British comedies. Uh, I one thing I probably should have done was, okay, pulled his information up. Um, the Bookship, sometimes, always never, of course. The Limehouse Gollum. He's been in Red Nose Day Love, actually, as well. The Best Exotic Marigold Hotel. The Second Best Exotic Marigold Hotel. The Constant Gardener. 
Valkyrie more and more and more. He's been he's a very good actor. Um, I enjoy a lot of his work. So we see him in his well. He's meeting up with uh, his son uh, to go on a trip. We don't really know what this trip is, um, but you can tell right away he's kind of like an inconvenience to his son, at least at this point in the film. And they don't necessarily have a great relationship. Um, they're going on a trip. They don't really tell you where. And they show up to this building. They had an appointment, which is not kept. So they have to stay overnight. And of course, uh, Alan has been already prepared for this and booked a and b which his son did not know and did not want to go to. Uh, and this is where our board game aspect comes in, where actually it's, it was a bit earlier. I apologize. They show Alan has an addiction to his phone. And mm-hmm. you find that he's been playing um, Scrabble on his phone. Um, and it's pretty funny. There's a lot of um, dialogue about what it's like being on your phone and having conversations in real life. And it was very relatable, I think, to people, uh, mm-hmm. at least for me. Um, so they get to the air, they get to the B&B and there's a couple that are there. And we find out quickly that Alan is also basically a Scrabble shark. He mm-hmm. kind of baits and cons people into playing a game of Scrabble where you can tell he's been playing for a very long time where he's thrown out these crazy words. And and uh, he made a bet with the husband and wife, uh, but not knowing – the wife didn't know he made the bet. So the husband is being very uh, aggressive and angry when – Words are being played that he doesn't agree with because he's essentially losing money that she doesn't know about. Do you want to mention anything leading up to that part, at least? I don't think so. Okay. Well, his son goes to bed early because he he knew exactly what his dad was going to do. We later find out that those people are also – well, those people are in town to identify a body at a morgue that could be their missing son – and mm-hmm. then this is kind of where we find out that that is what their original appointment was for as well. Right. So it's an odd coincidence. And of course, the next day they do run into each other at the morgue. Uh, there was a funny thing that I related to because the the guy who works at the morgue couldn't, he had to cancel his appointment because of, uh, I think they said family matters or something. And yeah, then Bill, like and that, then yeah. Alan's walking with him. To the morgue to identify it. And he goes, you know, it's funny. I thought you were a woman. He's like, oh, yeah? He's like, yeah, well, family issues. And you had to leave work. And the guy was like, okay, jerk. Uh, yeah, I have a right. three-year-old son, and it's just me. <laughs> the mother's not around. He's like, oh, sorry. <laughs> right. I was like, hey, my wife's around, but I got a three-year-old son. I can relate to how terrible that can be. <laughs> In the best way possible. Uh <laughs> So yeah, we find out that uh, the 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 body is not his son, which of course he is like kind of relieved, and and they kind of end their journey. You don't really know <clears throat> where it's going to go from there. We do get a catch a brief glimpse of um, his son's wife at home with his with his son, who's constantly playing some type of World of Warcraft game right. on, on his computer and. You see this other disconnect where the mother's trying to talk to him and he's just kind of going, uh huh, or not listening. And there's like no connection there, which really, I think, kind of full circles this this movie and the story um, with Alan and his son's relationship. But, uh, you know, they, they part ways and then all of a sudden. Now, did you figure out what his son does for a job? I did not. I couldn't figure it out. I thought maybe taxidermy. Yeah, I'm not totally certain what he or does. Or painting or something. Anyways, they yeah. get to he's working in his house and um his father shows up at the window, which in a in a comical manner. Uh this is called a comedy. I would say it's mostly a drama. There's definitely comedic aspects to the film. Mm-hmm. Um but yeah, uh it was I thought it was pretty comical the way that he interacts with um his son. Uh, who I keep calling him his son, um, but his name is Peter, how he interacts with Peter and Peter's family. Um, and he just kind of ends up showing up to their house and, and basically just 
living there for a little while. Um, and you can kind of tell that Alan is, even though he doesn't have a great relationship with his son, he definitely misses his son, I think is right something that is kind of put out there. And he kind of, he befriends Peter's son, who we find out likes a girl, but his son is like a skater boy, like mm-hmm. goth dude, and that's just how he dresses and he doesn't talk to people. It's a really funny moment when he shows up to breakfast uh, and the yeah. mother shocked. And he's like, well, grandpa, I was playing a game on my computer. Where else am I supposed to go? And they're like, no, no, right, no. Right. we like seeing you for breakfast. He pours himself coffee and the dad takes it away from him because he's too young for coffee. I thought it was pretty funny. They did a pretty good job showing like this family dynamic and how Peter's like family, t- like it kind of comes across as kind of normal, but it, he, the more he talks about it throughout the film, you realize it's just an, like a facade. Like um, there's a point where he mentions his, how like what his relationship with his wife is like and, and his son. So, you know, one night you can hear Alan teaching Peter's son Scrabble on the computer and how to play words. And he talks to him about talking to this girl and how he has to get a haircut and check out his suit, get a nice suit. So we, this is where we find out Alan is a tailor. We didn't know that right. at this point yet. Um, we still don't know what Peter does. <laughs> uh, maybe it's in a deleted scene. <laughs> it's like stuffing the squirrel. Um so there's an interesting like part with like it, it was really nice to see how Alan is being fatherly to Peter's son and teaching him about suits and how to dress and and how all that works out, which I thought went really nice. Um, and it kind of culminates at the house at least with the girl coming over for Scrabble and they're kind of playing socially. Um, and Peter's listening to his father kind of question words and what's a word and should we look it Mm -hmm. up and and this is how we find out that michael stormed out over well actually do we even find that out yet no we don't find that out yet it was like over the word zo z-o right um but he he kind of says like this is why we don't like playing you you know this is what you used to do to us you tortured us and then his son gets mad because he's not even playing the game and he's like being very critical of, right, his, right. of his father. Um, so then I, I want to say soon after that, well, actually, we do find out comically again that Alan starts seeing the woman who was with her husband at the, the yeah. B&B. They got divorced and then he ends up <laughs> sleeping with her in his son's bed. Right. <laughs> and when confronted, he says, well, you can expect us to sleep in the bunk beds in your son's room, did you? <laughs> Which was, and I think they ended up doing that anyways, because they like wink at the next room over when he goes right. back in. Um, like cheekiness from the, the grandfather uh, character. Um, I don't know. Uh, where, where are you thinking? How are you feeling in this movie so far? Are you enjoying it? What are your thoughts? Where are you sitting? Well, Josh, let me ask you a question. <laughs> yes. When I say Wes Anderson to you, uh huh, what comes to mind? Uh, Royal Tenenbaums. Yeah, I guess more right? specifically. So this movie to me now back in the day when I was a young lad, uh, this was a movie that college Kyle would have probably seen in a theater in a heartbeat yeah Uh, i was one of those people who would take my weekends and if i wasn't going to see a concert i was going to you know uptown or lagoon theaters in minneapolis and seeing all the independent films and doing kind of that thing so this is my bag like back in the day (laughs) this was the stuff that i did going to st anthony maine all that good stuff and this movie to me as i was watching it really made me think of and reflect on Someone who really enjoys Wes Anderson movies, but maybe doesn't have the budget uh, or time to create a Wes Anderson film. Yeah. Because, yes, there are definitely humorous moments in this. Uh, the, this movie is shot with a very specific sense of style. Uh, the the dialogue in this movie, uh, I think overall, is, re- is pretty well done. Yeah. Uh, but this movie, this is one of those movies that if you're not comfortable with listening to people sitting and having conversations. <laughs> yeah. 
you're probably not going to dig this movie. Now, that being said, <clears throat> I like these kind of movies. Right. <laughs> like, I, you know, this is the stuff that, you know, when we talked about On Board With Everything, we had the conversation of movie versus film. Like, this is a film. Yes, this is a this film. Is, <laughs> this is a film. Uh, and I really didn't know what to expect. You know, I, I had read through it, you know, having Bill Nye in the movie, you're, you're, you have some expectations as to the quality of, of um, acting that's going to happen. And he definitely doesn't disappoint. But I was, um, at, you know, to the point where in the movie right now, I was having a good time. I was enjoying myself. I, I, I was struggling a little bit to try to figure out, you know, how do all of these separate threads pull together into one coherent story? Yeah. Um, because it seemed like we were really connecting um, very disparate threads from different places um, and spending time with very different topics and things. But always kind of coming back again to the idea of Scrabble. Scrabble was always kind of center to whatever was happening. Um, all the relationships were basically based on Scrabble. Yeah. Um, you know, that was the thing that was communally done as a group, uh, which I thought was cool. That's, that's a neat little um, mechanism to bring people together, to always have something in common, uh, to always have something they all care about or, ha- or are learning from one another. Uh, I, I thought was neat. So, yeah, you, up to this point, you know, I am enjoying the crunchy dialogue, uh, the kind of the oddity and the the quirkiness that uh, Bill Nye's character Alan has as he as he's going through life. Um, I'm, I was having, I was enjoying myself so far. Nice. Uh, okay, yeah. So at, the, at this point, Alan goes missing. I guess really, the, the Peter's son is just worried that his you know grandfather packed up and left after the right. argument over the Scrabble the night before. Um, and of course, Peter says, you know, he's gone home, he's not missing. And, and after much protest, he ends up going to his father's house, who he finds out his father's not there. Um, and I, can we call, she's not his mistress, but the woman he see. he's seeing, he, she shows up and, and she has a very emotional reaction um, to seeing pictures of Michael, Peter's brother, Alan's son. Mm-hmm. Um and calls her now ex husband to pick her up there, which I thought was <laughs> very awkward. Uh, yeah, it was. definitely Wes Andersony for sure. Um, uh, so you know they end up leaving, and uh, Peter travels to uh the old, I guess camp camper campsite mm-hmm. camper to try to find his father there as well. Um, he. <laughs> So he doesn't find him there. He he looks around the, sh- the the camper a little bit. He ends up going to like a boatyard the next day, to which there's some, a pretty <laughs> funny scene between him and a a boat a boater, uh, the guy who works at the dock, marina, whatever you want to call it. Um, and then we find go ahead. <laughs> you had a I just I just revelation. had the epiphany. He paint <laughs> Peter. He paints trucks. Remember? Oh, that's right. He with painted the ice, the ice cream, cream truck. truck. Yeah, with the ice cream truck at the very beginning. I don't know <laughs> why that just suddenly came to me, but it did. Yeah, he paints, he paints trucks. trucks. He paints trucks. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Well, you know, it went right past me too. So I'm glad we're on the same page. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so that's on us. <laughs> yes, that is on us. Uh, I don't, yeah, I don't know why suddenly that just came back to me, but it totally did. So we find out Alan went out on a boat for some reason, and he, comically he sh- he sinks it. Uh, so you know he picks him up, and we get, we get a lot more dialogue between father and son, and and that's where we find out. I believe this is where we find out Michael stormed out over an argument. He was so mad about his father being so critical. We also found out that Alan was also a single father for a, mm-hmm. for a bit of time. Sorry for the right. fireworks going off in the background. On June, whatever, like people can relax, right? Uh, <laughs> and then, and you know, and, and Peter tells Michael, uh, Peter tells Alan, like you know, he he was just angry. It's not he didn't leave over Scrabble. Um, but what we do find out is that that Alan isn't just like incessantly playing Scrabble because he's addicted to it. He, we find out he's been trying to find. Michael by Michael's play style, which is right. crazy to me. The amount of games you would have to play, but right. also crazy in a way that a father who lost his son is it's not so crazy. It's right. a way to keep a grip on reality and hope. Mm-hmm. Right. So he's been playing all these games of Scrabble to try to find a player who plays like his son, Michael. And he thinks 
he found, I think Skinny Thesaurus was the guy's name, his username. Yes. Uh, he thinks he found this guy. And he tells Alan that he's set up a meeting and he's going to meet him and he's going to confront his son after all this time missing and and all this. Are we spoiling the movie too or should we just leave it at that? I mean, I think we probably can leave it at that. I think we've covered most of the plot points. Yeah, yeah I think we've covered most. Of it. So I think we can leave the remaining that is there there. Yeah, I don't want to spoil what happens afterwards. Uh, we pro- as a review, being our first movie review, we probably really just kind of went as an overview instead of a review. <laughs> so if we want to do a review point <laughs> now and review it, we could also do that. If I send Kristen an email like, yeah, you can listen to this episode at this point. <laughs> and we basically just tell the whole synopsis of your movie instead of <laughs> reviewing it. Uh so let's let's do this before we okay let's talk about our overall thoughts on the movie what were your overall thoughts did you enjoy this if you had to give it a rating out of five stars what would you give it Ooh, out of five yeah can i do half stars yeah i would probably give it a three and a half out of five uh seven out of ten if you want to look at it that way i think this is a good movie i don't know that it is a great movie uh, I enjoyed my time with it, and like I said, I think the cat, the acting is very good. I think um, Bill Nye and Sam Riley as Alan and Peter do a great job. I really, div- I really buy into the relationship that they have as father and son, uh, and the challenges that can exist, especially as you grow up and you, you know, are trying to navigate a father who's clearly a little maddening. Uh, <laughs> so I, I think their acting is very good. Uh, like I said, I think there's a, it, I feel like when watching this, there's a lot of inspiration from like a Wes Anderson, um, where you're really focusing it and the strength of this movie relies on the characters and, uh, the way those characters are able to tell their stories. For me, I just wish there had been, this is going to get hard because I don't want to tell something what to be. Um, <laughs> I, but I think the, the title of this movie is sometimes always never, and you talk about how this comes from the idea of that three button suit and, and how you button it. And the fact that in the synopsis, it talks about how Alan is a stylish tailor. And to me, that is such a small part of what this whole movie is. And part of me really wishes we had more experience with seeing him in his shop, creating these suits and really solidifying the personality of the way he is and how he got to be the way he is. Yeah. Um, so yeah. So for me, like I said, I think it's a good movie. Uh, I, I am glad to have had the opportunity to watch it. I, I enjoyed my time, uh, but this is definitely a film. It's something that um, relies strongly on the quality of the performances, which are, are good. Uh, the script, like I said, overall seems solid. The music, actually, I really enjoyed. Yeah. Uh, I thought the music did a great job of setting the tone for what was happening in the in the film. Um, but for me, like I said, it's just a few disparate pop points that kind of don't all pull together at the end. Uh, because we don't talk exactly about how the film ends. We don't spoil anything. But I, I wasn't disappointed by the end. But I just feel like it didn't quite pull all of those plot threads together. I don't want to say as nicely as I was hoping, but maybe I, they didn't quite tug it as hard as I was hoping they were going to. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, I totally get what you're saying. So that was my thoughts overall. Like I said, like the movie, uh, but I, I do think that this is go- this movie is going to appeal to a very type of cinema, per- a very specific type of cinema person. Yeah. And if you are that type of person, I think you'll really enjoy it. What are your thoughts? So, yeah, I mean, I'm a little bit higher on it. Um, I'm at, I would give it a four out of five. Um, okay. But for a lot of the reasons that you said, um, it, it really, I didn't know anything about the film. If I would agree to have a hundred percent with you on one thing, it would be the title. And I think if you just change the title, you're not missing the Taylor stuff. If you're, right. if you're, if you're looking up what the title means and why, why it's in there, if they had named it something differently, um, maybe there could have been a closer connection to, Scrabble or even just family aspect. Um, but like going into it, all we knew was Scrabble was in it. And that's why we were yep. invited to, to watch it. I really enjoyed um, the dialogue in the film. I, I thought the acting was great. Um, and I really felt that every, everyone was like, 
what's the word I want to use? Authentic. Like, mm-hmm. I really felt like these people weren't playing characters. Like, these people were like these characters in real yeah. life. And uh, what something that happens in this film that I like in a lot of movies is you are discovering things as the journey progresses, but you're also discovering them after important things have happened, happened that give you explanation. So you Mm -hmm. might be watching a scene and be genuinely like concerned why that he would talk to his son that way or why his son would talk to him that way. And then you don't find out for like another act later. I actually like that because for me, it gives it like uh, a reason for a rewatch. I like to sometimes watch movies again where I know the full detail and then I can even like appreciate those scenes more. Um, so I really, I really enjoyed it. Uh, um, the, I would say I, while I was happy with the conclusion of it, it's, I don't actually, I didn't mind the conclusion. I wouldn't say I was happy with the end, mm-hmm. um, which probably keeps me from giving it a higher rating. Um, but as far as like the storyline beats and the acting, um, and the relationship between Alan and Peter and, and how you learn more about why Alan is the way he is really right. made me appreciate his character more. And then in turn made me appreciate the acting more um, yeah. because you really have to be good at pulling that off. There was even a right. scene where he's sitting at the table with Peter and I was just watching the actor um, who plays Peter, um, Sam Riley, just watching his reactions to Alan, um, even facial movements and stuff, not stuff I pick up on a lot of movies, Right. And perhaps why we're saying it's more film than anything else is why I was picking up on that. Um, but I really like, I thought everything that I saw, um, I enjoyed for the most part. So um, I really enjoyed it. And yeah, you're definitely right. If you're a Wes Anderson fan or um, if you're into some of those like British comedy dramas, dramedies, even like pirate radio and things like that. I think this is also a movie that's that's for you um, as well. Which <clears throat> leads us to the release date for this mm, film. Yes. So we have something new that I am not familiar with. Have you heard of virtual cinemas? <laughs> I have not. Okay. So Sometimes Always Never is releasing in virtual cinemas on June 12th. Um, and there's – if you go to bluefoxentertainment.com – and you find the movie it actually shows you can purchase tickets for virtual cinemas uh Boston I have Coolidge Corner theaters on here in Boston um uh if you go to variety they kind of tell you how the virtual uh cinemas work um uh, but basically um the cinemas are using their own virtual cinema platform so i guess you will pay them cinema Money and they'll give you a link is what I'm guessing is how it will work, um, but you'll able be able to watch it in virtual cinema on June 12th, um, and uh, it releases. Well, it releases in two traditional cinemas if they're open uh, in Boise, Iowa, as an example. Theaters are open uh, on June 26th. You can see it in June 12th in certain traditional cinemas. In, in states that have them open, and it will be on demand um, on July 10th. You can find it on your on-demand platforms then. Um, I don't, I'm not sure what it's going for, but it was originally uh, pushed back from April due to COVID, so we will be getting the release on July 10th on demand. There we go. Very cool. Uh, just a brief... Uh, note uh, the movie is directed by Carl Hunter. Thank you. Yes, uh, who is a British director. Um, he has pretty much done a lot of uh short films and kind of all those things. That's kind of where his uh previous experiences lie. Uh, but according to IMDb, here's a fun little point of trivia he's the former bass player with English pop group The Farm, whose nice. biggest hits were All Together Now and Groovy Train, which were both top 10 UK hits in 1990. And the number one UK album, Spartacus, in 1991. Wow. And he's now a lecturer at Edge Hill University in England. So there you go. Awesome. It was also written by 
uh, screenwriter Frank Cottrell Boyce, who wrote uh, Goodbye Christopher Robin, amongst other films. Um, and Sam Riley, who played Peter, was is uh, in Maleficent, as mm-hmm. well as Pride and Prejudice and Zombies. Alice Lowe, who uh, I believe plays his wife, was in Bandersnatch, uh, the Black Mirror film, uh, as well as other actors. Tim McGinnery from Notting Hill, Jenny Agutu from Queen of the Desert, and Call the Midwife. So there's definitely some great acting in this uh, as well. So if you check this out, let us know. We would love to hear your thoughts on the film. Indeed. All right. Anything else you want to say about that or any of our our topics from the evening, Josh? How cool is it that we get to review a movie on our board game and video game podcast <laughs> i know that was awesome that was an excellent we were very excited to have that opportunity so thank you we have uh like i said we've been pretty quiet on social media so we haven't reached out for questions uh that'll probably change in the coming week here um we might get back to that and being a little more active there uh and then obviously this movie is also going to be our well-rounded life recommendation um so we're kind of wrapping all of those things into our final topic so josh that means it's time to wrap up the show cool Let's do that. Let's do it. (laughs) Thanks for joining us, everyone. In addition to finding us on Twitter and Instagram at Board with Fiji, you can find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash Board with Fiji. So feel free to give us a five-star rating over there. Also, if you want to communicate in the... Oh, boy. Let me start that again. Also, if you want to communicate in more long form, or you're just not feeling social media, feel free to email us at boardwithvg at gmail.com. Send us those movie reviews. We'll do some more. <coughs> Board with movies. That'll be our next podcast. <laughs> um, we tag our stuff with hashtag Board with VG, So please use that hashtag as well on all social medias. And whatever podcast service you're listening to us on, we encourage you to give us a stellar rating. That is whether you're downloading us from the PSVG feed, the Dice Tower Network feed, or our very own standalone Board with Video Games feed. You can find me on Xbox Live and PlayStation Network and Steam at Why So Serious. That's S I R R I U S. Kyle, where can people find you? So you can find me at all the usual places Twitter, Instagram, PlayStation Network, Xbox Live, Board Game Geek, all at Psychocross, C Y C O C R O S S. As always, if you have suggestions for future topics, be sure to reach out to us on the social media because we want to talk about what you want to hear about. And remember, everyone, whether it be board games or video games or movies, Never stop gaming and movie watching.